Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested. And it's Jeremy from Tested. Welcome to Projections, our show about AR and VR. Uh, today we're going to be reviewing a, uh, I would say maybe the first big killer app for VR. <laughs> the first big killer app. Yeah, no, I would, I would agree that Lone Echo and Echo Arena as a pair are the first killer app for virtual reality, thank you. Meaning like it's worth getting VR, uh, in this case the Oculus Rift, because it's an exclusive to that platform, Yep. just for these games. Mm -hmm. uh, it's made by Ready at Dawn. We've been hyping it up a lot. It's been out for a couple weeks now, but uh, we thought it'd be a great time to talk about the single player and just what makes this game so compelling mechanically, narratively, and how it takes advantage of VR, the VR platform. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about the game itself, uh, the, the plot. Lone Echo? Yes. We're starting with single player. Let's start with single player. Okay. Uh, so, Lone Echo, you are in, on a space station uh, that is orbiting Saturn. You are a, a mining operation. And uh, you, you play the role of an AI, right? So there is a human on board who's named Olivia, and you are her, her friend uh, for all intents and purposes. Right. And in fact, your relationship with her is one of the most interesting things about the game it, since you embody an AI and she is a human. But uh, even though you embody AI, you have a body. You have a You have a robot body, you have physical presence in this uh, space station, in this mining facility. Yeah. Uh, you are, both of you, you and your human NPC companion, uh, are floating around in zero gravity. Let's talk about that body for a minute, because when you get into this game, one of the first things that you notice is you are fully articulated. Right. Uh, your, your hands are some of the best inverse kinematics and animation that we've ever seen, I think, in, in a game, certainly in VR. And it's not that this game is tracking any more points than no, any right. other game. It's still tracking th three points of positional movement, yeah. your head, two hands, and of course, where your fingers are relative to the buttons and the mm -hmm. buttons you're pressing. But uh, it is extremely, extremely compelling, not just because of how um, the animations react to what you're doing, but how they interact with the world. Right, so you can grab anything, uh, practically anything. So any surface is, uh, is grabbable, even if it's not a handle, right? Like your robotic hands have Spider-Man abilities. You can just simply stop yourself on any, any surface. And you pr propel yourself through the space by grabbing a surface and throwing yourself. Um, but beyond just your hands, like your whole body is, is modeled. And it, your legs do not end up being where your legs are in real life. They float behind you, right. the, depending on what your momentum is. Because it's zero-G. It's zero-G. And, and what surprises me most about that is that it breaks what I assumed was a rule we'd all come to accept about VR, which is only show the tracked objects. You know, it don't, don't throw in you know, elbows and legs and things that aren't actually there because it's going to break the illusion. But for whatever reason, with Lone Echo, that's not the case. Um, and it's not that your real body is, you lose a sense of real body, because your real body is actually moving the whole time as yeah. well. It's a 360 game. You're supposed to be interacting with things in front of you, you're supposed to be turning around, interacting with things to the left of you, behind you. So your legs are moving, your whole body's moving, but it's not matching up to necessarily with your robot body, and that's okay. It's, it's wild, because it feels absolutely realistic, but <clears throat> it's certainly not where your actual body is. And in fact, if you uh, fly really quickly through space, uh, your legs start to, f and then you turn around, you see your legs like going out in front of you. So yeah. it's, it's very unmatched to where you are, at least your legs. Uh, your hands are generally in the right spot, exactly where your hands would be. Uh, and if you try to grab a surface that is uh, difficult for them to do the math for, they still do their best and they don't move the hand in order you know, to get a better looking grasp. They, they prioritize keeping the hand where your hand actually is, which I think is really smart. The, the collision model here is, like, it's just mind boggling what they had to do to make it work because uh, you can't clip through walls. If your hand hits a tactile wall or object in the game, uh, the hand will stick there, but your real hand, the one my hand, will want to naturally go through because I'm not actually right. hitting anything. Mm -hmm. So you see a ghosting effect. Right, so they, they allow you to keep a, you know, a mental connection to where your actual hand mm -hmm. is in reality. Which doesn't break the logic of the game or the fiction of the game. It's just a mechanic that just ends up working. Interesting, yeah. 
Um, so in addition to throwing yourself through the world, you also have these jets on your, on your wrist, which are sort of the opposite of an Iron Man style system of movement. So whichever way your hands are facing, Superman style, uh, you press a button and you are propelled that direction slightly. Like it's not a jarring movement, you know, it's, it's, they're very gentle with motion sickness. I think that they, they've engineered this from the ground up in order to, you know, to account for motion sickness as well as immersion. And mm -hmm. that's what's so wonderful about this locomotion mechanic is that they have given us the best sense of freedom as well as like the, the strongest reduction of motion sickness. Nothing feels like it's ever cheating. You're never, teleporting is technically a cheat, but everything is fluid and continuous to a point where I'm moving, flying through the inside of the space station yeah. from one room to the other, whether it's by grabbing or using these thrusters, the feeling of space is continuous. Mm -hmm. It's like it feels like it is a massive, massive space that I am taking the actual time to travel from point A to point B to point C, and to when the point of the game where you actually leave the space station, it's outer space. Absolutely. And you feel like if I drifted off in one direction, I would just go in that direction forever. Yeah. And it, in fact, there are freighters that will—they're like taxis where they take you from one uh, area to another in the outdoors area, but. You're welcome to fly there, you know, yeah. if, you, if you want to take your time. And that's a wonderful way to experience the game. I mean, there's a lot of room for exploration in this game if you just want to take your time doing it. If, if you try to speed run the game, it's probably still going to be a six hour uh, single player experience, which is pretty substantial in terms of what we've seen so far from single player in VR. Sure. But if you take your time, you can easily double that. And it's a really heavily narrative driven game. Like very much. Very, there's you're you're doing tasks for Olivia. She's sending you on these missions. You're a subservient robot. It, it makes total sense. You know, there's radiation areas she can't go in that you can go in. If you're you get damaged, you get to teleport, reconstitute yourself in a new robot body, deploy from another mm -hmm. like a robot hatch. Uh, there are other robots that are lower intelligence than you that are also flying around that you encounter. You can grab them. You can wave to them. You put them together. But it feels like a living, breathing space station was as strange as that sounds, but it feels like a real place. Right. Like they've done so much with the, the um, just the design of the UI, design of the interior of the space station. Not every panel is tappable, but there are interactions you can do with, with all sorts of things. There's, it's a really interesting mixture of, of sparse and immensely detailed. You know, because like you said, you're in outer space, so there's a lot of empty space, and there's maybe a handful of areas that you can fly to in this area, but when, it, each of those spaces is just jam-packed with detail. Yeah. And there's you know, geometric detail as well as like really rich textures on everything. At the same time, I think that that emptiness and, and the textures themselves are often sort of flat shaded. You know, they're, not, they're t filled with grit and grime, but it's generally like even colors. Mm. I think even that and the open space lends itself to comfort. Yeah, totally. I mean, when you're, when, when, I first exited the space station. You're set outside to do a couple early on missions. No big spoilers here. But when you, you know, you could take that transport, the taxi, mm -hmm. to get, fly yourself to the cargo containers. Or you could just say, I'm just going to spend this time wandering the exterior of the entire ship, the entire space station, crawling across. There are handles on the outside just there, as there would be on the International Space Station. And you can pick out things. And it's like, it's not just a, a one model. It is, it is a, almost like an interactive world. Um, it made me feel like I wanted like a Fallout or some type of open world RPG, and then this made it possible. Like a bigger game. Like a real big game. Yeah. Uh, th there's more, like towards the second half of the game, which we won't go into, more happens uh, beyond the scope of what I thought the game was going to be. Uh, so it certainly is worth the money. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right, I, I could see this, especially this locomotion mechanic, becoming a, a standard for VR. And if not zero G, at least this system uh, that we've also seen in the climb and climby, where most of the, of the movement through the world is, is one to one with your hands. So mm -hmm. you're moving your body by, mo by grabbing an object in the world and moving your hands and the, either propelling yourself or you know, climbing. That seems to lend a great deal of immersion and comfort at the same time. And it was seamless between the rocket propelled mm -hmm. hands, um, which maintains conservation momentum, the one-to-one -one movement, which you're a robot, so you're gonna move very quickly, yeah. or s using a vehicle, that tax system, which isn't enclosed. You're sitting just in an open cockpit, and you can still see the world. You can let go yeah. anytime. It will just 
for Interesting, like you. unlike most cockpit games that we've seen so, so far, even in, in Lone Echo, you, they don't control your yaw. They don't control your rotation left yes. to right. Like, you can manually snap left and right a couple degrees. Right, and that's primarily how I turn in the game. I, I, don't, te I don't spin my whole body around in fear of losing tracking. Uh, so I, I tend to use the snap rotation, but the ship itself will not rotate you. You still have, that's like right. if you hold on and it rotates, you're gonna find yourself doing this and you have to compensate for that. Yeah. So as far as the gameplay goes, it's mainly like a puzzle game, right? Yes, yeah, um, so you're doing things that would in other you know, traditional 2D flat screen games feel like simple puzzles. Mm -hmm. like, putting a robot together, cutting a hole here, plugging the thing, but because it's also well tied into the story, the immersion of feeling like you're, you're a robot astronaut, and, and the fact that you're actually doing these things in your hand, the simple act of grabbing a cargo container and putting in a cubby, and seeing the light change and replacing a fuse, mm -hmm. feels compelling. I enjoyed the holographic user interfaces that they have in the game. There's some really, it, you know, really smart ideas that the developers came up with for what would be fun to do in VR, you know, particularly where you actually have all this hand tracking and can move things around and very simple puzzles. Like I was never stumped by what I was supposed to do once I got there. Mm -hmm. um, but I pro more often than not, I was actually stumped often by just trying to figure out where the thing was that I was supposed to be interacting with. Right. And not in a bad way. It's like I, that was the exploration aspect of the game. And being surprised that, they, wow, they did program a full hologram on this table. Like so, a moments where you're sitting across from Olivia, you're both floating, yeah. and you're looking at this holographic display, and she's talking to you, and you have a conversation system to enact responses, just as you would in an RPG, choose your responses, mm -hmm. and then you hear your voice, right. replay it back, it felt like I was in Alien or Avatar or, or mm -hmm. like any amazing science fiction film. I was, I was there. Olivia, the, the player in the game, is uh, the player model is actually modeled on the actress that played her. Mm. So they did a 3D scan. So the face that you see in the game is the person speaking the lines in real life. Um, and she, I thought the voice acting in the game was some of the best that I've seen. I mean, it's not the first time we've interacted with an NPC in a VR game. There have been other NPCs, but this one, it really, it felt alive, right? Like, yes, she was running through a script, mm -hmm. but the, the writing is so good, the performance is so good, and your ability to interact with her with dialogue, with your own dialogue, and call out things in the world that she then responds to, it really felt like you're building a relationship. It's interesting you say that, because as soon as you jump into the game, it's evident that she has a relationship with you. Mm -hmm. She, as the human, has yeah. developed in this isolation a relationship with an AI. And that's never fully resolved in the game, and that's one of the most interesting you know, aspects to it. I think the developers were probably more interested in how you as a player would you know, appreciate her as an AI in, in the, you know, the real world, right. which is kind of flipped. But what happens towards the end of the game it fulfills that arc for me in, in a really powerful way. Very satisfying narratively. Yeah. Now, when you were playing, did you respond like, did you try to mess with the labor units? Like, you know when people play first person shooters, you try to, you, when an AI's talking, you're just kind of wandering around and you don't yeah. have to really listen to them or maintain eye contact. I found myself really wanting to role play this and like paying attention, nodding my head, mm -hmm. giving thumbs ups. Like, I was really into it. I, I don't know for you, but when I assembled one of those uh, labor bots, I just, Thought it'd be fun to give him a thumbs up, man. Hey, nice, nice job. You're alive. Go fly. And he gave me a thumbs up back. Wow. Flipped my lid. I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. Yeah, it's it's, it's it, it, like we can't stop gushing about it, but we don't want to spoil too much. We're going to talk more in depth about it on the podcast yeah. in the future in terms of the story points. But it is it really people have said that in playing this game, they've had dreams and memories about their experience. It's like it's so. In, did you do it all one sitting? No, I did it all in one day. One day, yeah. Okay. I, I think Ben from Polygon uh, said what you're saying, which is that he has memories of being in outer space, not of playing a video game. Yeah. And it's, it's that level of immersion. It's really, really good. But we have to talk about Echo Arena. Of course. Okay, well. okay. Uh, so this is the multiplayer component that comes bundled with Lone Echo. It's also, if you don't want to buy Lone Echo, it's free right now uh, for like uh, people. Two and a half more months. Yeah. Yep. Um, and it's... The Ender's Game sports <laughs> game. It's like it's. Yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, they had open beta. We've, we've talked about that. It's it's a competitive esports game in zero G um, in VR. It is literally that because it's part of this Intel initiative to to create esports um, inside VR, and Echo Arena will be a part of this uh, competition. Uh, it 
I think it actually evolved from a game jam that they had within Ready at Dawn mm. uh, when they were already working on Lone Echo, and so they forked it, and they, they have entirely separate teams work on both of these games that are released simultaneously. Um, it is zero-G disc soccer. Right. So you got three on three, and you enter an arena, and uh, you work with your team. It's all voice communications, so there's six people in this, in this game, and uh, you're passing the disc to one another. You're same locomotion that you see in Lone Echo um, with a few, with a couple uh, changes, like the, your, your jets on your wrists are infinite in Echo Arena, whereas they're timed, they have a cooldown in, in Lone Echo. And uh, so you got two points if you, you walk, if you get close to the goal, you get three points if you throw it in from a distance. Um, you can punch people in the head to disable them, then they have to drop the disc and they can't do, they can't control their mech, their, their robot for a few seconds. Uh, you can grab the disc from people. If someone's coming up to you to hit you in the head, you do this number, yep. and uh, that causes them to get stunned if they hit you. There is an enormous amount of strategy in this game. I mean, and so much so that like, some of the best players in, in the community um, who are untouchable by, 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 by my standards, and I'm an okay player, they played against the developers in a community versus developer match and were trounced. Wow. So, I mean, the, the, so the there's people, depth. Yeah, there's definitely depth and nuance to this game in a way that you, you expect from the great esports. You know? and, and it feels like, I and mean, we made the analogy before, like Rocket League for VR, um, because people who are good can do absurd things. Right. Like, they're, they're really, like, you can have fun being playing with newbies, you find other people of your caliber, you can have totally a, lot, a, a ton of fun navigating the arena, throwing the disc, but when you watch people who are really good, they're like acrobatic in ways that you couldn't even imagine. And they can turn on features of being upside down. Exactly. And, and flipping their orientation to where you, I'm just snapping left and right. Right, but it really comes down to how well they can use their environment. And so they, they will grab walls and throw themselves back and forth in order to juke and fake out other people. And I think we're starting to see, like when it comes to esports and VR, there will be an advantage to having a big play space. Yeah. Like that's not just something you might want in order to enjoy a single player game. Like if you're gonna play competitively, it's gonna be the equivalent of the high DPI mouse. You know, of the expensive rig, you're going to want a big play space with a good tracking volume. What does esports at a physical location, when someone puts together a tournament for Echo Arena, look like? Because it's not going to be rows of tables with people holding controllers. It's going to be like rooms or segmented areas. It's going to look more like almost like the Olympics. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They're going to need like designated play spaces right. with headsets mounted maybe on ceilings. And, and they're going to have, you have to give people the freedom of movement mm -hmm. to actually take advantage of, of a VR. Yeah, but it has to be standardized. There's just no way to do that at home. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but that's something PC gaming has always, you know, I'd even say like struggled with. It's just a fact of life. Yeah. So um, have, have they said, it's, it's one arena, have they said mm -hmm. uh, there are more modifications, things or uh, no. improvements for this? They haven't, they haven't said there'll be different style maps, uh, having played the game. And you know, going back to Lone Echo for a second, it's kind of impressive that this whole game takes place, and it seems like from day one they didn't want to make it an action game. It's, it's very slow paced, you're in space. Mm -hmm. It's you know, supposed to be, you know, you're careful, it's dangerous, there's just environmental concerns, and it, it's generally a slow, non-action you know, puzzle game. Um, also in Echo Arena, they could have added weapons. Yeah. No. Like this is, this is a, a mechanic that would lend itself so well to so many game types though. So you, I'm curious to see, you know, if they would have, you know, take the same kind of locomotion mechanic and uh, incorporate pistols or some other type of, you know, grappling hook or other type of, of game modes, like you're saying, if not in Echo Arena. Maybe another game. Maybe their next game, or someone else uh, taking this as a starting point and going from there. It just seems like sky's the limit with the types of games that you could make with this type of locomotion. Right. The, the foundation is there. They've yeah. solved. They, they've. It really feels like we've reached a next hurdle for movement. And now you can start incorporating all sorts of things that VR can do that you can't do in the real world. You know, breaking physics, portals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, flipping gravity around. Like things. All these things that may work. Like you can just. They could add that on. It's it's tons of potential. Uh, it is really, I think, a killer app for for VR right now. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's the first one. I, and it, literally, it has been for some because the um, the lobby for Echo Arena, like every VR lobby, is more fun than it has any right to be. And uh, so people hang out in there and they talk and they chat and they're, they're introducing new people to the game. And I've heard people in there say they bought a computer to play this game. It's t it's totally worth it. Yeah, it if you have VR, um, whether it's the Vive or the Oculus, you know, get revived and get into 
find a way to get into it because yep. it's totally worth it. Uh, totally. Uh, so our showcase this week, we're going to talk about VR covers. Now, okay. uh, this is a product that's been around for a while. Uh, the people who made it basically had the idea of creating these, these uh, gasket masks yeah. for uh, VR headsets. We had them for the developer kits. Totally, exactly. And they, they look like this. Like, they are little wraparounds that you put around the headset. Mm -hmm. They're soft. They're a little better than the foam that you get, uh, at least especially with those developer kits. Mm -hmm. um, but I never thought that the, the Oculus headset was uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? The, the foam that comes with it, with this facial interface, was totally sufficient. It's pretty good. I will say though, having played uh, having played Echo Arena for over an hour, and with all the physical movement, it can get hot and sweaty in there. So um, I have actually <laughs> invested in some uh, bandanas to put it around that area of my of my forehead. Um, so I, I'd be I was very curious about this this product. Yeah. So, but they've improved their product to be more than just this cover. Yeah. Uh, to a point where they've actually designed and manufactured replacement facial interfaces, mm -hmm. something that Oculus themselves had promised to do in the beginning uh, when they announced the, the Rift, uh, the CV1. So uh, this is their replacement. And this is a red one. They have a red one and a black one. The red one just is more visually distinctive. Uh, but what's interesting is that it comes with this fake leather cover that you can peel off. And this, this cover here, I think, is much more comfortable than the foam that comes with the standard Oculus headset. Okay, because of the material that covers it or because of the, uh, the softness of the foam itself? I think the softness of the foam itself. It's, it has, it's very plush, it's mm -hmm. very soft, uh, it's very gentle on your face. Um, they say it's a little wider than the Oculus facial interface, but we found that they're pretty much exactly the same. Right. But what is different is that you can also buy one that's a standard uh, depth or one that's a longer depth so for glasses. For eyewear, so, so there's more space between the lenses and your glasses, essentially. Right. right, which is interesting because on the Vive side, you can push your headset closer and further away, mm -hmm. and some people push it one even closer to your eyes because that enhances the, the field of view. But if you're wearing glasses and you need glasses for VR, you actually want a little bit of distance because you don't want the lenses to be scratching the lenses inside right. the headset. Uh, so I got to use it for a, a little bit last night. I was really surprised by how easy it was to remove this facial interface from the actual Oculus Rift yeah. itself. It pops so off. This is the, uh, it just pops, literally snaps in and out, you just pull it right out. And it comes with an identical uh, molded part that snaps in in the exact same way. Yep, so this one pops in. I think the red one just looks a little bit more distinctive, a little more, a little more gamer, I guess. Yes. Uh, but I, you were saying that you could you notice a little bit of red reflecting from your nose area. A little bit. It's you know like with all plastics, if you have a bright light, you can actually see it, it, passing through. You can actually see it even right now the the glowy parts. Oh, so not just down here, but actually a little bit all around. Interesting. A little bit all around, but it wasn't to a point where if I'm in a game for an hour, it would be distracting. Right. Especially if you're playing in a dark room, I would think. Exactly. One thing that I think they could do is actually make this wider. Um, significantly wider, mm -hmm. you know, by a centimeter, because my glasses don't fit in these very well, and like, right, it's barely, it's it's pushing against right here. I know a lot of people, it, it, Will Smith among them, have purchased glasses that fit in VR headsets. Narrower glasses, and the other thing is that they do leave the nose hole here open, which uh, I think it's intentional because you allow a little air to come in, mm -hmm. and you don't fog up. There are lenses inside, but on things like PSVR, you actually do have a little bit of plastic cover the nose mm -hmm. to block the light. So it'd be nice if they included an option. You have the little Velcro down here so you could stick on a piece of foam yeah. to block that light out. Um, I was a big fan of, of this actually. I know you don't prefer to wear this, but when I put it on last night, I found this to be much more comfortable. Mm. I mean, it almost looks luxurious as far as like VR headsets go. Uh, but it was like, it's just so much softer. It felt like lounging into a soft chair or something. Yeah. However, after about a half hour of playing, this doesn't breathe quite as well. Mm. And so I found myself getting a lot warmer around my face than I normally would. So I removed this. Then I found that the, uh, this uh, faux leather that the material is on, the, on their padding um, had an almost like a sticky kind of sensation to it. You know, because my face had Tackiness. become warm and, and maybe a little wet. And so, yeah, it, so it wouldn't slide around quite as easily as the foam. Um, so my experience was for short VR experiences, this would be ideal. Uh, for longer ones, I, I think I might prefer the, the official Oculus interface. And the official Oculus interface has changed as well with the new touch bundle. They've redesigned that and they're going to send us one of those so we can do a comparison. But anyone mm -hmm. who's bought a Rift in the past year, year and a half, 
Got the um, old one. It's, yeah, he have, has the old one, and they're selling these for $29, $30, yeah. which I think is a totally reasonable price for comfort. By the way, if you're having a VR party, or you're having people over, you're demonstrating VR for a bunch of friends, this would be a no-brainer investment for 30 bucks, because that way you don't get all the germs and all the people crud on your VR yeah. headset. Yep, and so easy just to snap one out and replace it back in. Yeah. So thank the guys at VR Cover for setting us uh, this sample. Um, and we'll be back next week uh, with more demos, more talks, and more um, discussion about VR experiences. But subscribe to our channel, like this video, and Jeremy and I will see you next time.